I'm really excited to welcome Caitlin Dickerson. Um, she is an investigative reporter for The Atlantic, um, where she covers immigration. Um, before that, she covered immigration for The New York Times. Um, before that, she was at NPR. So um, she's been at a number of your organizations um, over the years. Um, most recently, uh, you probably know her from this month's cover story um, on the at, in The Atlantic, um, an American catastrophe, which goes into exactly how um, the government ended up separating 4,500 families over the course of 2017, 2018. Um, it was an 18-month investigation. Um, if you've read it, um, you know that it not only, um, you know, gets at uh, the the human aspect of it, but um, something that I haven't seen done before. It really gets into um, those kind of behind the scenes decisions that were happening and and mechanisms that were or were not in place at um, at DOJ, at DHS, HHS, um, and in the White House. So um, Caitlin is going to talk to us a little bit about that um, today, and then you know, as always, we'll open it up for questions. So thank you, Caitlin, for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is really exciting to just be in a room or virtual room among journalists um, because you we speak the same language. So we can just kind of get into the nitty gritty um, in a way that isn't always the case. So um, I'm going to talk about my process in the story about family separations. Um, and I, it, it's a very long one, 18 months long. So um you know, we'll get into the specifics of, of whatever it is that you all would find helpful at the end. But just to give you a sort of top line preview, um, I think this was a story that I knew I had to do. So um, my first job as a reporter was in investigative reporting. That's how I learned to do reporting, which, as you all know, is not necessarily traditional. But it means that I rely on and go back to those basic skills with every piece I work on, even if it's a feature. And I'm always asking questions in the background, even when I'm writing a feature story. You know, what are the push and pull mechanisms behind this? Who's responsible? Is there data associated with it? Is there a larger system or trend at play? And so I think that's why even in the beginning, when I first started hearing about these isolated cases of children who were being taken away from their parents, and I knew that the administration, the Trump administration was, was telling me it wasn't true, even though I had evidence that it was, that there was something larger going on. And then, of course, that became truer and clearer um, with each passing month for a year and a half of family separations. So by the end of it, you know, there was no question. I needed to try to get to the bottom of what happened and how it happened and why it happened and who was responsible. You know, I think in part because of the morality behind the decision to separate families and, and much has and, and is rightfully made of, of that choice, which really stood out from American history and deterrent strategies that had been pursued by the American government in the past. And I've studied our enforcement policies all the way back to the 1800s. But I think actually more than that, right, that there were things about family separations that seemed to conflict with basic tenets of the functioning of our government, politics aside, even policy aside, you know, this is not a country where the White House can lie to reporters. It doesn't matter who's president. It's not, not a country where um, an executive branch office, you know, an agency can be dishonest and mislead reporters and mislead Congress and therefore, of course, mislead the public. And that seemed to be happening over and over again. Again, it stood out from tough stories I've done in the past that people weren't happy about um, when they were held accountable, but that they didn't try to deny or, or dispute. They, they offered context. Um, they offered, in some cases, apologies. That's, that's more traditional, as you all know. And so um, when I came to the Atlantic, it, it's actually a story that, that they were really excited about. And you know, part of kind of how they convinced me to um, move over from from the times. Um, you know, we talked a lot about how a magazine format, you know, the length of it, 
um, but also the kind of non-traditional structures that magazine stories can take on would allow me to do something really comprehensive and deep and kind of leave no stone unturned. Um, and also it would allow me to not leave any scrap of detail into the story as long as I could justify its existence. And that's how we ended up with this 30,000 word piece, which is one of the longest stories ever published in the Atlantic because my editor worked really hard to make a case for every single detail that he and I thought was relevant and, and worthwhile. And, you know, I, I did get cold feet about it at times, especially toward the end and started saying, are you sure we shouldn't cut this? I, I worried that people wouldn't make it to the end, but um, I was able to, you know, trust in the expertise of those who are reading the story with fresh eyes and assure me that, you know, the length was warranted and, and I'm glad ultimately that we did. So when I got started working on this story, I knew it was going to be broad. I knew it was going to take a long time. I didn't know how long. Um, and it was very intimidating. You know, the question before me was, how did this happen? And I think that in some ways you're at an advantage when you're investigating something that, that happened in the past. The stakes, if you will, are a little bit lower. That wasn't necessarily you know, the case to, to, to a great extent here because this was a story and an issue that people cared about and continue to care about really, really strongly. And so it was still very sensitive. But when you're doing an investigation, I think it's generally true that looking backward can be more accessible. Um, however, there was this huge question of access. You know, I didn't know if Kirsten Nielsen, who was the Homeland Security Secretary, was going to talk to me. I didn't know if John Kelly, who'd been Homeland Security Secretary before her, would speak to me. You know, I didn't know if Trump would speak to me. I didn't know if Stephen Miller would speak to me. And I think it would have been easy to get really overwhelmed and kind of paralyzed by those questions and not um, made a whole lot of progress. So, um, you know, I just had to jump in. I relied again on, on those basic tools that I've been developing for almost 10 years now and tried to treat it like any other story. Um, that's one of the reasons why I always tell journalism students and, and newer journalists that, you know, these repetitions that we do covering stories that feel lower stakes, you know, covering the city council meeting, covering the, you know, local policy change all of them prepare us for, you know, a much bigger and higher stakes moment that will inevitably come. And we have to be able to call on our skills and they have to be, you know, they have to be like muscle memory at that point. So that's kind of what I did is I just kind of tried to put aside, you know, fear about who would give me access, who would give me documents and just start doing one interview after another. Um, and I pursued them again, very basically. A lot of my interviews took almost the exact same format where I would explain to people why I wanted to do this piece. You know, I, I would say, I think this is a really important moment in American history that everybody paid attention to. It seemed in the country, but few people fully understood. And I knew when I was covering it that the full story hadn't been told and, and I want to tell it. And usually people agreed with me, you know, people who were involved in family separations really wanted to set the story straight. Um, and so that helped me get into it. And then my interviews were chronological for the most part. I would say, you know, where does this begin for you? And so if it was a border patrol agent I was talking to or somebody who helped establish DHS under, under the George W. Bush administration, then we would start in the 90s. You know, if we were talking to you know, an, an aide who found themselves in this role that they weren't necessarily qualified for, um, didn't necessarily have the experience to, in the Trump White House because of the struggles that the administration had in hiring. So which meant that people were elevated kind of beyond where they would have been in a traditional administration. You know, then we would start, we would start at January 20th, you know, we would start at transition and, and just jump in and, and, you know, the, immediately it became clear to me that there were all these broad themes, you know, um, for example, like this deep distrust of the bureaucracy, not just of progressives and you know, closeted liberals in the administration, but anybody who wanted to prioritize process over action. You know, that was a really important theme. Um, you know, deep distrust of the media, that was also a really important theme. Again, plays like a really significant role in, in the evolution and the development of this policy. Immediately, some of those, those themes started to jump out at me. And, and then I started to feel overwhelmed again because it's like, how am I going to get all of this? into a story. 
So thankfully I have a, a very generous and kind of voraciously curious editor. Um, and you know, I hope you all get to work with somebody like Scott Stossel one day because um, you know, he just couldn't get enough. And, and that was really what allowed me to keep reporting and going deeper and going further and really satisfy that hunger that, that you have at the beginning of a piece to really feel like you've gotten to the bottom of something. I mean, you don't want to stop reporting at an arbitrary deadline. You want to keep going until you feel like you're done or until you feel like you really know what happened. And so that's, you know, that was the case with this piece. It was going to be, and there were several issues that it was initially slated for. I think it may have been slated for last December and then for June. Um, and then it was pushed to September because of the war in Ukraine. So thankfully, you know, the Atlantic would come to me and they would say, hey, okay, your, your story is up. We're going to close it. And, you know, my editor and I were able to make a case for the fact that we felt like actually we needed more time and, and we wanted to keep reporting. And, um, and I, thankfully, I got to do that. So, you know, I do all these chronological interviews and, and I did certain things that I do with every story again, um, or at least every investigative story. I established a timeline, which I'm sure you all know um, is incredibly important and helpful. I usually do it in Excel, very straightforward. Um, I did the same thing with the documents that I got through FOIA and those were daunting. I mean, I have, I should have taken them out to show you, but stacks and stacks of FOIA records that I got um, and Mark, who may be in the audience, who was at the New York Times working on FOIA, you may have actually worked on some of these requests with me. But, you know, I would get back 600 pages completely disorganized, didn't make any sense. And so I laid them all out on the floor. I put them all in order. And then I created um, a what would you call it, like a, a catalog or a dossier of each record. I, I do that in Excel as well. And, and I can talk about that if that's helpful or interesting to you all. These are things that I always do. And then I had, you know, quickly um, the realization that a lot of people were going to provide conflicting views of this, right? This is a story where everybody had an ax to grind. Everybody had a narrative to push. Um, I knew that going into the reporting. And then, you know, it became clear um, soon after I started my, my interviews, although I will say that ultimately what you read, first of all, if you, if you read the piece, you know, it's all shored up by, by records, um, and, or, uh, numerous sources. If there was anything that wasn't even an anecdote, you know, a conversation that happened in a meeting, um, that I, I didn't have a document to prove, I made sure that I had a number of sources for each of those instances and also a number of sources who weren't allied with one another, Right. Um, and so I got to know, you know, the relationships and where the chips fell and, and how these people all relate to one another now. And are they still friends or are they enemies? You know, these are former Trump administrations who are responsible here. And so I, I would ensure that if even there was a tiny detail um, that I had, you know, four or five, six people to corroborate it if there wasn't a record of it. Because, because again, this is a story where everybody's sort of really eager to clear their name, even when it's not warranted. And so I tried something new which is that I created a, a chronology and it was very helpful. I think it's something that I'll do again in the future. So, you know, the story spans the, well, 9-11 um, and the establishment of DHS all the way to today. And so that's basically what my chronology looked like. And, and it was very specific. So you'd have in 2017, you know, March, a specific meeting that took place at DHS headquarters with, you know, the acting Homeland Security Secretary at the time, you know, the, the, the chronology was, it was granular. And so I would slot in what I heard from each person and, a certain, and the, these documents got huge. I mean, my computer was not happy with me and, you know, they, a couple of them got over 200,000 words long. Um, but that's kind of what it took to basically, you know, look at a moment in the history, find out what every single person had to say about it, you know, from Kirsten Nielsen at the head of DHS to anybody at the White House to anybody on the ground in the enforcement apparatus to families, children, lawyers, um, you know, again, just from the top down, what is it that everybody had to say about this moment? You know, what's important? What does my reader need to understand? What's true? What feels factually supported? And, and that's how I reported the story and how I kind of pitted against each other these different accounts that, that I received. Um, so the chronology document was, was very, very helpful. And then, you know, fast forward to 
the end of my, my reporting, when I have these massive, massive troves of information, again, of, of data, of records that I obtained through FOIA, my chronology, and then I created another um, document where I categorized information that I got in interviews under these themes, um, some of which I mentioned. And, you know, I have this massive trove of information. W- what do I do with it? How do, how do we put this all together? And again, that's where I just give all credit, frankly, to um, my editor for not sort of requiring me to pursue a, a traditional or a sort of expected structure. You know, one one opportunity, one option that we talked about um, that I think would, would come up, you know, for any reporter who's pursuing this piece is, well, perhaps I'll interview a family about their experience and I'll sort of toggle back and forth in time from this family that was separated, this one family, to what sort of official Washington has to say and then to perhaps what, you know, local enforcement officials have to say or what, you know, shelter workers or employees who are caring for the children have to say, kind of a traditional journalistic structure. Um, and there are a number of reasons why we didn't pursue it. Um, one was that I had so much material and, and it sort of moments in time expand and contract. There are moments that I can dispense with really quickly and, and need to just get past to sort of say, you know, Kirsten Nielsen is confirmed as Homeland Security Secretary, moving on, we don't need to dwell on it. And then moments that really needed to stretch out, you know, for example, 2014 in the summer when the Obama administration was dealing with a really significant increase of children and families crossing the border, which leads Tom Homan, um, who ultimately became the head of ICE and is the person who came up with the idea to separate families to propose it. Um, the Obama administration shuts it down. But, you know, that whole argument that moment, the different perspectives, John Kelly, who was a, in the military at the time, you know, Jay Johnson, who was the Homeland Security Secretary, Obama, um, you have Jonathan White, who's an official at HHS, who plays a very significant role um, in, you know, family separations and, and trying to stop them and then trying to reunify families under Trump. You know, you really have to get all those perspectives in there. And so it was going to be limiting to try to go back and forth in a way that you might in a traditional narrative. Um, you know, it was also clear that I just had a, a massive number of words that I needed to get down on the page. And so we didn't want to do anything that would feel too repetitive. And, and I was also really cognizant of wanting to point out, um, again, the relationship to the press and the significance like in the White House and in the executive branch and the significance of it as family separations begin, they increase, we start reporting it, nobody believes us, you know, and the administration is so skeptical that what they kept arguing was, well, this reporter has cherry picked one case, that's the worst possible case. You know, they found a harrowing, harrowing story when in fact, all these other instances they would say were very, you know, smooth and calm and humane and, and are really not what this reporter is making it out to be. You know, that clearly wasn't the case. And, and it had sort of been proven that it wasn't the case by the time I set out to write this story. But I still didn't want to, you know, leave any any room really for, for that argument to be made. And so I decided to report this in a way that really emphasized the totality of experiences of families. I went through with a research assistant at the Atlantic, thankfully, um, hundreds of, of complaints that were filed by separated families, some filed in federal court, some filed with the government to try to track themes in their accounts um, and, and draw on them. But, um, you know, it was, it was really important, you know, it was a very divisive moment, of course, it's a very divisive topic um, to make sure that this story was really airtight and then another thing that you all might want to get into is, um, you know, that interviewing families who are separated is really, really painful for them. Um, it's really difficult. And it wasn't something that I wanted to do lightly. You know, I've done a lot and I'm sure you all have too. a lot of interviews with people who've been through terrible things. And, you know, it's a painful experience, but you, know, you, you talk to people who are willing to talk to you and then, and then you, you all do your best to try to move on. You know, interviewing separated families, I found was really a, an experience to, unlike any other, you know, even when I would talk to mental health professionals for the families in advance, even when I would use trauma informed reporting techniques, even when, you know, I'd sort of establish boundaries with the family at the beginning and, and remind them throughout that if they wanted to take a pause or didn't want to talk about a certain thing, they could let me know. 
um, you know, I, I nevertheless have watched a number of separated parents have full blown, you know, PTSD flashbacks right in front of me. And so, you know, I was not interested in reporting this story in a way that would require a bunch of people to bear their soul in a way that, that could potentially be very damaging if I couldn't assure them that I was going to be able to use all that material. I mean, as you all know, a lot of times you do these interviews, it doesn't make it in the story. And, and we really couldn't justify that either. So for all these reasons, um, we decided to just kind of throw the playbook out the window and try to get everything down and try to introduce some pacing to, to keep people sticking with it um, and to just smash as much possible reporting as we could into the story. So that's kind of the broad view of my approach to the piece. Um, and uh, let me know if I should keep going or if I can answer some questions. I think we have some questions. Um, so uh, folks, just a reminder to say your name. Um, Caitlin can see you, but it's from that camera. So you can speak in that direction. Uh, hi. Um, hi, my name is Candace. I work for the 19th. Um, I, okay, I'm going to limit it because I, but I have a million questions, <laughs> but uh, I'm just curious, like, I truly, to be honest, cannot fathom working on a, a, one story for like 18 months um, or 30,000 words. But like, in that time, did the story evolve in a way that surprised you? And did you hit uh, a roadblock or two or three that you're willing to, to share and how you kind of work through that? Absolutely. And, and we can also talk offline afterward if that's helpful in any way. Um, so did the story evolve? I think that for the most part, this was a straightforward process in that, you know, and I'm, I also could be frankly forgetting, you know, moments because it was such a long timeline. But um, I think that what evolved that was kind of surprising or interesting was that I'm always, I'm really interested in subtext. I'm really interested in not just what people are saying, but what's going on in their minds and, and what are the, if, if they're willing to share it and, you know, what are the tensions, the sort of um, very low level and immediate tensions of like a confrontation and argument that happens between, you know, for example, Homeland Security Secretary and her head of Customs and Border Protection, but also what else is she weighing, you know, in this case, um, being called a squish, being called a Republican in name only, you know, having to prove that she's tough and, you know, really the other individual facing those same pressures. And so how does that, you know, change the the, the mechanics of decisions that are made, all that stuff fascinates me endlessly as an individual. And, and it often doesn't end up in a story, um, you know, or, or it, it's sprinkled in here or there, but, but the psychology was actually really central to, you know, trying to answer this question of how family separation came to be. And so I think that, you know, though it wasn't necessarily like an evolution, it was a, the, I, I wasn't actually expecting to be able to include as much of that as I was ultimately able to. And again, you know, I appreciate that my editor said, yes, this is just as worthwhile as, as the record, you know, that you have. And I, and I think it's true. Um, and I think it's kind of what makes this story a little different than other coverage, but it was, you know, it was a new writing challenge. It was a new reporting challenge. It was a new fact checking challenge, frankly, um, and, and, you know, relatedly, you talked about roadblocks. Um, I would say access is, of course, the biggest one. Some people were willing to talk to me immediately. Um, some people weren't willing to talk to me until the 11th hour. You know, for, for the most part, I actually had a lot of success with this story. Um, but there were, you know, in terms of getting people to um, agree to, to talk to me, um, but there were some holdouts until the very end and, and actually in the fact checking process, which was just massively helpful um, to have as a support system, you know, as an investigative reporter, historically, I've always had to do my own fact checking um, and to have this separate independent team. In this case, I had six checkers to help make sure that all my, you know, I's were dotted and my T's were crossed, you know, who I could also refer to while I was making my, my pitch to ask somebody to be willing to speak to me. And I would say, you know, 
just so you know how this process works before publication, a fact checker separate from me, you know, um, is going to contact you at the Atlantic. It's going to go through every single quote of yours, every single thing mentioned about you, even if it came from another person, but they're also going to go over the context around those moments and quotations with you to make sure that you have everything exactly right. And they'll answer any questions as will I about the story that you may have prior to publication so that there are no surprises. I mean, I know we all subscribe to the, the no surprises rule of journalism, but to have that extra support, I think was really um, helpful in getting access. And I think was also just helpful in, in making sure that I felt good um, publishing this massive work um, that even though we had 18 months to work on, it did feel like a rush at the end um, because we we're effectively editing and publishing you know, a small book um, so yeah, 18 months is a long time just to kind of hit on that first point that you made. Again, I didn't necessarily think it was going to take that long, but I, I, going into it, I was pretty sure this was going to be about a year long, um, which is, you know, not always the best when you've started a new job, you're working in a new newsroom and it's like, all right, see you in a year. You know, I've written a couple small things for the Atlantic here or there, but for the most part, this was my life for my first 18 months of working for them. And I just, um, really had to take it day by day. It's, it's daunting. And, and it's also true that not every story requires 18 months. Again, you know, you'll, you'll know when you find that story um, and that you have to stick with it, but every piece doesn't have to be that way. It just, it was just the way that, you know, things shook out in this case. Okay. Sorry. One more, one more. Um, um, uh, to hit on your point, the last one that you made about your first 18 months at the Atlantic being with a new editor, that seems, um, scary for, for me uh so I'm just curious like uh, I mean we don't need like details but were there certain things that you were looking for in those conversations and thinking about like I'm thinking about this giant project I, it, you know with you all and what were you looking for in your editor that kind of made you uh, you know think I can do this here um so you mean what made me decide to pursue the story or um, what kind of helped me along the way? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, when you were making the decision, you know, to go from the Times to the Atlantic, oh, I see. yeah, what mm -hmm. were the qualities about the editor, you know, that made you feel confident in your decision to move over there? I was in an incredibly privileged situation in that I was really, um, happy and in a good situation. And so it wasn't like one was better than the other um, or that, you know, I was, it was, it was a good situation and that I could have stayed at the times and done great work. And I also could have gone to the Atlantic and, and had an opportunity to do great work. So um, sometimes those decisions are, are sort of extra hard, but um you know, I think that there was a lot going on at the Atlantic in that moment that gave me a lot of optimism, you know, really throughout the Trump administration and the pandemic, just a real sense of um, moral clarity around, you know, the mission of journalism, the point of journalism, you know, what we're here to do, which is to inform everybody in the country, not just one group or another, not to confuse them with both sidesism, but to do fair and balanced and rigorous journalism that actually helps people in this democracy, in this country, make fully informed decisions. I mean, I feel like the Atlantic, um, just got it and, and was, you know, had a lot of work to prove um, that this was something that they were going to prioritize. Um, and again, and two, it's, it's right. It's the, the length, frankly, um, that you're afforded at a magazine, um, the creativity when it comes to the style of writing, um, you know, again, not to say that you can't do it at one place or another, um, but it was, it was just something that they did really well. And then, um, you know, getting to work with my editor, who's been at the Atlantic at least 20 years, um, maybe even 30 years. I don't want to date Scott, but, you know, he's done everything and he's written books and he's edited incredible people and he edits incredible writers now. And, and I think that um, it's a real privilege to work with somebody who's done a little bit of everything. Um, you know, they have a certain confidence. They have a certain... 
um, level of experience that, you know, it just makes them feel like, yeah, let's just try this. You know, what's, what's the harm? Um, and, you know, again, a, a great privilege. So that was kind of what helped me decide to pursue it. And then, you know, as I was reporting the story, just, we were just in touch all the time. Um, I communicate with my editors a lot. I've always been told that. I remember my first reporting job, I said to my editor at one point, like, I'm probably in your office as much as the other reporters, right? And he was like, no, you're in here the most. <laughs> and um, I didn't, I didn't realize it, but I, I still think that that's true. And I, I don't think that I'm necessarily a needy reporter, but I like to geek out about what I'm getting. I get really excited about my material when I come back from a reporting trip. And, you know, the first thing that I want to do is go knock on my editor's door and tell them all about it. So um, that, you know, the fact that my editor was willing to have those conversations all the time, um, again, just kind of helped me, gu helped guide me and helped give me confidence to keep going, even though it was my first big story at a new news outlet. Um you know, which is not to say that there wasn't pressure and stress along their way, because there absolutely was. But I had a lot of support. Uh, I'm Kirk Beta with National Journal. Thanks for your time this afternoon. Just two questions here. During what was the like aha moment during your reporting process when you realized, oh, this is going to be an 18 month long project? And can you go a little bit more into detail? And what was the fact checking process like? You know, where there's a a lot of deep paper trail reporting. And then some of those, when you're doing those interviews with the separated families that might not have as deep of a paper trail. How do you, how does your team balance that and how do you balance that reporting? Sure. So um, aha moments, I think were two that I mentioned. So one sort of recognizing when I got started with interviews that when I asked people to start at the beginning, they were going back to the nineties or they were going back to the early two thousands. That to me made me feel like, okay, this, you can't tell the story of family separations without telling the story of deterrence. You can't do that without telling the story of where DHS came from. You can't do that without talking about 9-11 um, and history dating back even further. You know, it would not have been a service to a reader to pick up with this piece in January of 2017. So I think that was one big aha moment. And then another was these other themes that I talked about, um, you know, the political pressures within this particular administration, um, the, the general tensions that exist between the bureaucracy and political appointees, which wasn't something that I really understood um, at such at that, that great depth um, prior to working on the story, um, you know, again, the relationship to the media, um, the tensions between the various federal agencies involved in immigration enforcement, all these things started coming up in my interviews and, and made me realize that this isn't just a straight um, chronological story. This is a story about kind of human nature and psychology and career ambition and, you know, the, the bureaucratic structure and system. I got really interested in the way that policies are actually made literally in, in the federal government. So who comes up with them? Where do they go next? Who weighs in? Are there meetings? Are there emails? You know, who gets excluded? Who gets included? Like all of that was really critical to understanding what happened to family separation. It's also broadly applicable. And so I felt like there was a lot of um, service journalism or, you know, it's significant service to be done there and, and helping people understand not just with regard to family separation, but in general, you know, how our policies made, you know, it's, again, our role is to help people see inside our government and understand how it works. Um, so you asked about interviewing families and children and, um, the sort of parts of their stories that may not have been as well documented. Um, you really don't see very much of that in the story at all. And, and it's, of course, you know, everything is attributed. So some examples of information that's included about parents and children, you, um, you see references to court filings that families have made and and sort of similarities and arguments that families have made. And, and we say, you know, this is an argument that a family... Um, made in a, in a complaint that they filed in federal court. It's, it's identified as such, um, you know, with the understanding that these are um, firsthand accounts, they've been presented to lawyers um, who are, you know, who vetted them uh, prior to submitting them to the court, you know, um, people who are from, you know, established uh, law firms. Um, but, you know, it, it is at the end of the day, you're, you're talking about a firsthand account or a collection of firsthand accounts. And so 
if to the extent that any of that was included, it's identified as such. Um, similarly, there's one family, one father in particular, who I interviewed back in 2018, who comes back in this story. And for the most part, I'm describing our phone calls and our, our conversations. You know, he does tell the story of what it was like to cross the border with her, her, his daughter, you know, what specifically was said and what was done. Um, it very much aligns with everything that records do show um, in terms of separations. It's also not a whole lot of information. It's very straightforward. You know, border patrol agent went to take the child away. She tried to cling on to her father. She screamed, she cried. I mean, this happened in thousands of cases and, you know, it's, it's supported by a, a massive number of families who experienced it firsthand, but I also worked really hard in the story to talk to a, a Salvadoran consular worker who is stationed in a, a CBP processing facility who watched the separations happen firsthand. So, you know, it's, it's a small amount of detail, but it's important to, in any case, of course, you know, make sure that you can shore up what you're hearing as much as possible. And, and, you know, that account was really uncontroversial and, and repeated, you know, in, like many, many times. So I, I felt good about it. My name is Susanna. I'm actually cover immigration at Roll Call. Uh, I was curious uh, to hear your thoughts on like how to sort of more generally achieve balanced reporting in immigration. I always found that's one of those topics where you'll have like the immigrant advocacy groups and then you'll have like racist groups um, and sort of trying to come up with a way to show diverse points of view without highlighting those and kind of specifically to your story. Like I've certainly looked to former homeland officials as sources to weigh in on things. And, you know, when you're looking at past administrations and you're like, oh, I'll include former officials from Democrat and Republican administrations, there's the balance. Do you think that like the Trump officials, like who like, like your Tom Homan and who's now obviously not heritage and very much sends out press releases offering his expertise on stuff. Like he, as your story highlighted, was like a huge instrumental voice in family separation. Like should those people not be quoted in stories as like an expert voice or just weighing in on a policy because of what they've done. But on the other hand, of course, they're familiar with deterrence. And as we see this administration's influenced by those pressures as well, just love to kind of hear your thoughts on how to balance that. Sure. Um, so I think that, you know, you're referring to a handful of groups that identify as think tanks um, that have, you know, that support um, just restrictions on immigration and that have published a lot of material over the years that isn't accurate. And, and there is unfortunately this reflex when you're writing up a quick immigration story and an editor says, you know, make sure you get, um, you know, if, if you have a, a democratic white house, or even if you had, you know, even if you had you know, Trump administration in office, you would sort of get your quote from the ACLU or you, and you would get your quote from fair. I've read those stories a lot. Um, almost never worked on one, but there are, you know, when you're collaborating with other people or whatever, um, there's that knee jerk reaction to just sort of go to the same people over and over again. I really try to avoid that at all costs um, because it's not it's not a service to the reader um, kind of in either direction. I mean, it depends what we're talking about. So if there's a policy change um, and you've got to write about it and you want to get some reaction, I might try other things. I mean, I might avoid going to those same small groups based in Washington, D.C. that are not super closely tied to the public um, and that don't don't really reflect, um, I think, accurately how people are, are feeling in a, in a meaningful way outside of these small circles. So, you know, I might think about a place where I think a policy is going to have a really big impact and go a little bit more local. Um, you know, sometimes that's like talking to sheriffs, sometimes that's talking to mayors directly, um, who I do think, you know, uh, have a finger on the pulse, you know, and if they're, even if they're taking a really strong stance on one side or another, they've got more of a leg to stand on and more support for what they're saying than somebody who's um, holed up, you know, on K Street or what have you. So I, I might think about going local. Um, I might think about going academic. You know, there are experts who um, 
know a lot about immigration and, you know, support sort of conservative values from an academic perspective based on good research. Obviously, you want to make sure, again, whether you're talking about somebody who's progressive or somebody who's conservative, what, you know, they want to make sure that their research is strong and that it's supported and that it's peer reviewed. Um, but that's one direction that I might go. And I also just try to go to real people. I mean, I know that's a privilege that you probably don't have a lot because you've got to move quickly. But um, certainly if you can travel, do your door knocking um, and just get creative and think about like civil, civic organizations, you know, school district officials. Um, it really depends on the policy. So we can, we can talk about it more specifically, but I, I would um, urge you know, getting creative and not going to the same four voices that run organizations again on one side or the other that I just, I, I think you were right and you were getting at this, just not really a good reflection of where the country actually stands. Um, and I do think that people in the United States have really strong views on immigration right now. So it's worth getting them out there um, and digging into them. They're, they're fascinating. Um, there's so many good stories to be done. So it's just like, hitting the pavement and, and just not calling those same groups. Not because I think you were asking, you know, should you not interview certain people on principle? And I, and I don't really believe in that, you know, this person did X, so I won't interview them. I don't think that's what we do. I think there might be some people who make those sorts of decisions, but that's not really a choice that we as traditional reporters get to make. Um, but you do get to make a decision about what is going to best serve your reader. Um, and I think you have a lot of options um, on on both sides, frankly, um, to introduce new voices and expertise and balance. And I'm trying to remember the second part of your question. Oh, I think it was the sort of the principle of interviewing one person or another. So I think I got everything, but let me know if I missed anything. Yeah, I had just like used specifically the example of like Trump administration officials who are super involved in like family separation and whether they're like you think a voice that serves, I guess, to use your word, serves readers or sh less so because of, you know, their involvement? Well, I think they, I think that they are really helpful, right? You know, somebody like Tom Homan has been working in immigration enforcement since he was in his twenties and he's worked for ICE and he's worked for the border patrol. He literally knows a lot of people who are still doing this work every day, but he also very much understands the ethos, you know, and, and the, history and the motivations and, you know, the pent up sort of frustration um, that somebody like him felt that, that again, leads to family separation. So I think that he, someone like Tom Homan um, can certainly be really helpful to a reader in um, just helping them wrap their minds around what's going on with ICE today, what's going on with CBP today. I mean, Homan gets that and, and, and other people like him. Um, and I also think it's important when you're talking to somebody like that, you know, to make sure that they're being genuine. And I'll say, since we're talking about Homan specifically, it's pretty straightforward and that you had, you know, a lot of people who said to me, they um, were, they were a little bit indirect or, or less forthright about their motivations and their approaches to things. Whereas Tom Homan is quoted in the story, very frankly saying, yes, I thought family separation would be a deterrent. Like what, what why are we even debating this? So somebody who's going to be sort of upfront, um, you know, though their, their history and their experiences like, upsets a lot of people, I, I wouldn't dismiss somebody like that as a source outright. I think it's all about just, um, interviewing him and then interviewing five other people to make sure that everything holds up factually, that it seems like his arguments are genuine, that they really reflect what's going on in the agencies. Um, but I, I would not, you know, urge uh, sort of not speaking to people who worked in enforcement under Trump. I think really, frankly, the opposite. I think they really understand how a lot of the rank and file feel right now. Let me know if you disagree. I think that's a really good question. I, so it's a really interesting topic, but that's where I kind of fall. Uh, hey there, my name is Matt uh, with the Washington Post. I So just on this piece, which is a very intense piece of journalism, seminal account of just how this family separation happened, it's also a very, very long, painful piece. How do you think about people consuming it and actually getting through the whole thing 
And then also, I know that you've worked in both radio and newspapers and magazines now. How do you think about different formats and actually just engaging with people in those different spaces and making sure that the story is told and like that each story is told in the most proper way possible? Um, mm. Yeah. You know, I, I knew that the story was going to be really painful for a lot of people to consume. Um, and that became clear as more people within the Atlantic read it and weighed in. And it really depends. Like I think a lot of new parents, a lot of people with babies in particular, for some reason, just sort of unscientifically, I, I tend to hear, have a really hard time getting through the piece. You know, I've had throughout this publication period, people say that they are crying, you know, they have to put it down, they can't finish it, they feel sick. Um, you know, I've had people tell me that they have nightmares. Of course, like none of these things are, are experiences that I wish to um, that I wish on any reader. Um, but I did, I didn't really think about taking that into consideration as, as I was writing. I didn't hold back, um, because I thought something was going to be too painful and, you know, it's not, it's not painful for everybody. Um, but for a lot of people it is, um, I just tried to, to approach the story like I do any other and include what I felt needed to be there, kind of knowing that people would take their time with it. And, um, have a variety of experiences. I, I have thought about since publication this question a little more because I saw some people sharing it online with kind of a disclaimer, like a mental health disclaimer, which I really appreciated. Um, you know, people saying like, if you struggle with depression, you know, be sort of aware before you go into this piece that it's a really difficult read. And I, I think that some of that is um, clear to people based on the headline and, you know, the deck, the description of what it is, but I appreciated those disclaimers. And I, I've thought about that, not necessarily should we have done that in this case. I mean, I'm, I, let me know if you think that we should have, but um, it's just something to think about moving forward. Right. Um, and that you see sometimes in particular, if you're um, working on a story about suicide, but I just, I just, I just wrote the story and sort of let people, I mean, I wasn't even sure if people were going to, as I said, make it all the way through um, and read it. And I'm, I'm really glad that they did. And, you know, I think that if people need to take breaks, that sort of makes sense to me based on, um, based on what happened. Um, and then you asked about radio magazines and newspapers and um, sorry, what the question about the different mediums was just, I guess, just what was the question again? I guess just what would be the the biggest differences that you've experienced between each of them? And then do you think that certain stories lend themselves better to certain mediums? I really do. And I've also done some video, which I was really skeptical of, really skeptical of. And then I did um, a story for the Times for their show, The Weekly, about family separation. And the feedback that I got was different from what I'm used to. It was a different population of people and they were having very, very visceral, powerful experiences that I don't typically get from a print piece other than this one, you know, people telling me that they're crying through the whole thing and things like that. So I, I really have a deep appreciation for all those different mediums. I feel really lucky to have been able to dabble in all of them. And I, I recommend it because it just gives you a little bit more license when you're taking on a new piece to say, I really think that this is a podcast. It's not, you know, a magazine story or it's both, um, you know, your editors are more likely to believe you if you've done a little bit of dabbling um, in, in different mediums. So I do think that my, my sort of working theory is that each story has an ideal medium. You know, I, when I think about a new topic that I want to pursue, I usually am right away thinking, do I think this is a magazine story? Do I think this is an 1100 word newspaper story, or now it would be like an 1100 word um, web story for me at the Atlantic. Do I think it's a podcast? Do I think it's just an interview, you know, a recorded radio interview? Do I think it's visual? I think video is the one that I reach for the least um, for a number of reasons. Again, I was skeptical of it initially. I'm not anymore, but it's just really, really hard. Um, you're talking about a whole different ballgame in terms of getting your sources comfortable um, to open up when you've got multiple cameras and lights in their faces, as I'm sure you all know. So um, I'm trying to think about how I know, I mean, which I think is the best in any given moment. I left NPR, I remember, with this sort of idea in mind that you know, I was an investigative reporter. I wanted to be able to grow my skills there and go deeper. And I felt like with audio, I mean, you're just 
you're limited, even an investigative audio story at most at, at NPR, I think it was going to be like 10 minutes long. And I can't remember the exact word count, but it might be like only 1500 words or something like that. Um, and you're also constantly having to take into consideration that you've got a signpost, that you've got to slow down, that your listener might be doing the dishes. So you have to like really, really simplify. Um, and I felt like that was a little bit limiting for me because I wanted to get more into data. I wanted to get more into document-based work um, and really extensive investigation. And I just felt like print was going to open up this whole other world for me because um, not only would I have more words to play with, but I also would have, you know, visuals on the page and I could have charts on the page and I could have, you know, interactives that were going to just like convey so much more material that didn't necessarily prove true. And that soon after I joined the times Trump became president and then I was doing breaking news coverage because so much was changing on a daily basis. Um, but, but in, in general, it's true, but then, then I sort of felt like, and, and do feel like you give up a lot in that, you know, there is just something about like, the sound of people's voices that I think conveys um, so much more than words often. And so I do miss that in stories. And if it's, if I'm working on a piece that I feel like um, is really sort of intimate, complicated, um, sort of emotionally grounded, um, I'm probably going to reach for audio and, and, you know, it, magazines, um, which I'm doing magazine writing, which I'm doing now is just kind of, I think, a medium that where you, uh, you get more length, but you also get more sort of creativity and more, um, I don't, I mean, that sounds a little bit judgmental of a, of a newspaper story, for example. I don't, it's not that you can't be creative in a newspaper story, but in terms of structure um, and in terms of um, pacing and storytelling, um, you can, people are sort of expecting you to be, um, more sort of fluid in, in those ways in a magazine story. And so again, if I feel like it's something that is really narratively driven or like something like this particular piece that had a structure, but it also didn't, but it also, you know, just did in some places and not in others, like a magazine was definitely the right place to do this story because the, the pacing of it just wouldn't have worked in, you know, these column inches and um, the sort of expectation that a reader opens up a newspaper with. So I feel like every story has the right medium and I'm always trying to just divine what it is. Um, and yeah, I'm glad I've done a little bit of everything because it gives me a little bit more license to kind of ask to play um, when I really feel like it's warranted. Hey, Caitlin, it's Mark. Hi. Hey, how's it going? Good. Did you work on family separation, FOIAs? I, I couldn't remember. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> you probably did, right? Yeah, we yeah. did. Yeah, we saw a lot, talked a lot about those. Question. All right, um, great. I was wondering if I could like kind of just like take a peek or get some insight into your like timelines you do in Excel. Because like right now I like write mine in Word and it ends up being like a long, massive document that I don't like to go back and look at. Yeah. Um, and just like I'm a spreadsheets person, so I think like the Excel thing would be like much better for me. So just kind of get some insight on that. Sure. So the great investigative reporter Kim Barker um, really clarified this practice for me, and I'm so glad that she did. So the spreadsheets are thus. I mean, it's basically if you're doing a, a timeline, it's it's dates. Um, on the left and then across the top, it could be anything from um, like the individuals involved, the agencies involved, notes, obviously, but that's very broad, you know, any type of like ca categorization that you could, you could think of doing. So it might be like Republican or Democrat, or it might be like White House or DHS, or it might be El Paso or, you know, Del Rio. Um, and then, and then, you know, notes and description, um, just so that I can, I can play around, you know, I can reverse the order of things, obviously, if I want to, if I've done an interview, and somebody's talking about something that happened in March of 2017, I can quickly look at my Excel spreadsheet and go to that date and, you know, the surrounding weeks or months and see what was going on for other people at that point. Um, so I try to just use that as a starting point now, like obviously the characters in the story who are involved in this moment in this entry in the timeline, I identify them just so that it's super searchable. 
um, and you can co- just constantly play around. Um, it, it's, it's super helpful, I think with creativity and really helpful with just efficiency. Um, and it was also really helpful for the fact checkers because they could refer to records like that. Um, you know, I would also use the timeline to, um, I would indicate like the audio if I had done an interview and I was record and I recorded it, I would refer to the audio file so that a fact checker could find that really easily so that I could find that really easily. So it's basically just dates on the left and then whatever it else it is that you're tracking across the top and just be as specific as possible. And as you know, Mark, like just always use the Excel spreadsheet. There's, you know, after you do an interview, you're just tired. I want to make dinner. I don't feel like putting this in. I'm going to put it in later. And then you forget, or then you do another interview and you get a backlog going. You just really, really have to force yourself to stay on top of it. It's an amazing tool. Gotcha. Cause yeah, I want to make the switch. I did a timeline for like something else. And then just like it, I didn't want to do it. I printed it out and went through the whole thing and it just didn't seem as efficient um, to keep yeah. it that way. So yeah, I kind of want to try this way to see if it's a better way of doing and it. And I did both for this story because, because I needed to have the narrative. I needed to have the chunks of interviews mm-hmm. from moments in time, but that's the document I did. It and didn't do it in word, but I did it in something like word, but that's a document I was referring to that became over 200,000 words long. Gotcha. And that was only after a year. I mean, I don't even want to know what the word count on it is now. So I had both one that was super searchable and quick. And then the other one that most, in most cases, I actually don't think that you need it all. But in this one, I did because I wanted to be able to, I was never going to be able to hold, like I did more than 150 interviews. So I was never going to be able to hold all of those in my head at the same time. Right. So I did want to have the chunks of the interviews that I could go back to. Um, but the Excel is just so zippy. Okay. And a quick follow up. When you write those chunks, right? Are they, um, so sometimes I've I did transcript and, chunks. I didn't paraphrase. Oh, gotcha. I didn't do any writing in the chronology document. I just would pull, I would, I would do my interview. I would clean up my transcript or go over my transcript or my, you know, my written transcript. And then I would just immediately start plugging chunks into this chronology document. Again, I don't think that you have to do it for every story. Like editors would kill me if I was suggesting that you should do it for a short turnaround. You should never do it for short turnaround. But for a piece like this that had all kinds of complicated themes, all kinds of um, conflicting motivations and backgrounds, like I needed to be able to very quickly access what everybody was saying and how it, it compared. So um, that's why I did. And I just kept it really um, clean in terms of not doing any rewriting. If there was a, a tangent that somebody went on or just lots of ums and uhs, I just would do an ellipse and then just keep going. Gotcha. Okay. So that I just had raw material in that document. Okay, perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm, I'm curious. Um, so obviously with this, you're a couple years out, you are focusing mainly on policy implementation strategy, DC. Um, but when you were in it, like when you were covering this happening in real time, the chaos of it, the, the trauma of it, like how did you handle that on a personal level? Like how did you handle staying with that kind of reporting? Mm. It was really, um, like a 24 seven operation, much like people who focus on science and health and, and covered, you know, the pandemic and still do obviously, but um, in the sort of early year, year and a half period, it, you know, it was definitely drinking from a fire hose as family separation ramped up again, alongside lots of other policy changes, not just family separation, but there was so much happening on immigration. So I remember one time I did an interview and somebody asked, like, who's the first person that you talk to in the morning and the last person that you talk to at night before you go to bed? And in both cases, the answer was my editor at that point. I mean, we were just in constant communication. It was seven days a week. And there really wasn't an opportunity to even step back and think, you know, how is this affecting me? Or, um, you know, how do I keep going or something like that? It was just, you just, you just had to. It was my responsibility. And I think, um, I feel a heightened, you know, I know this is all complicated, you know, our, our 
reasons for getting into journalism and our relationship to it. But my sense of kind of mission as a journalist is, is really heightened in those moments. Again, when stakes are really, really high for families, but there's also a huge amount of interest, um, a huge amount of partisanship. I feel like our role as reporters is that much more important in those moments. And that, so that certainly offers some, some fuel, um, you know, and I do always talk about self care, and I try to try to stay on top of it. Um, you know, try to get eight hours of sleep, and I don't eat terrible food, even though that's always what you want to do when you're staying up all night rep- reporting and writing. But like, try to stay healthy. Um, those are those things are generally true. Like, if I'm covering a natural disaster or I'm covering a breaking news situation that I've had to travel for and be up all night, like I try to adhere to those, um, standards as much as possible, just because I feel like it gives me more energy to keep going. Um, but with, I mean, I think with family separations, it really went out all out the window at some point because it was just so busy. So, um, didn't even really have time to kind of sit back and reflect. Thank you. Uh, any final question? Hi, thank you for talking to us. Um, I'm Ashley Murray from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm just wondering what you do in between these large investigative projects and how you deal with that nebulous space and, um, you know, what helps guide you to the next thing. So if I'm in a purely investigative job, as I have been at some point, I, I usually have, you know, three or four ideas that I'm nursing and developing and I'm interested in. And then at some point in the reporting, one of them will have a huge breakthrough or there will be a timeliness factor or something that leads me to say, this is the one that I need to pursue right now. And so then when that project is over, then I go back to the others and ask myself and my editor if they're still relevant, if they're still interesting, if they're still worth pursuing. Um, And so I'm kind of in that situation now where I had some other stuff that I was interested in that, that may or may not come through. Um, but more often in recent years, I've been in a space both at the times and at the Atlantic where I can and do write shorter pieces, like feature pieces, um, or, you know, something I'm working on a, a piece about a book right now. Um, something that's kind of unrelated, just as kind of a holdover. And then I, I always have my feelers out looking for the next big thing and just have periodic discussions. So, you know, I, I'm sure you do this, but I just try to always have a story list. Um, I probably, you know, started 10 years ago and like, it's kind of, it's, um, a lot of those ideas are the same, you know, you get rid of things when they become no longer relevant or interesting, but you always have just a certain number of things that you're nursing in the background so that you never find yourself having published something. And then, oh my gosh, what do I do? I have nothing to do. I mean, that's, I think the worst situation to be in because, um, it's stressful, but also you might have an editor say, well, why don't you do this? And you might not like their idea. So it's good to at least have your own, stories that you're constantly developing um, and that you have at least some string on so that, um, you know, you know, you have something to bring to the table, even though you may end up loving your editor's idea or you may end up pursuing it. Um, It's a good way to kind of sort of stay in control of your body of work and make sure that it's progressing in an intentional way in the way that you want it to in a way that that builds. Um, That's my approach. Caitlin, it's a stunning piece. Thank you so much for walking us through it. Thank you.